Well, friends, it's good to see you all. Thank you for being here. It is um, an honor for me to be able to introduce to you today our speaker, who is a very good, close friend of mine. Um, I can, on, for the last eight years, even a little bit before I started St. John's, uh, John and I um, uh, kicked off a really great friendship. And I just want to tell you a really funny story is that uh, right when I met John, and he, I'd learned that he was the editor of American Her Heritage magazine, um, I hooked him up with this film producer in Los Angeles who was a parishioner of mine back there. And he was working on a book, or he was working on a film uh, called The Road to Appomattox. Is that what it was? Yeah. And um, did you end up flying to Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. So John ended up flying to Los Angeles and really connecting with this guy. I don't know if anything ultimately came out of that. Um, they lost but, their funding, but yeah. Oh, they but, yeah. yeah, but it was really great. I just remember going, wow, this guy is the real stuff, you know, the real deal. So um, uh, John, as many of you know, uh, if you have followed him uh, in his writing, this, is, uh, this book that he's featuring today is his fifth book. And um, I've read two of the five and uh, really excited and would recommend this one to you. And, and do just want to make a plug. The books are on sale for $30, but John is donating $5 for each book to St. John's. So I hope that today you will uh, buy it because it's a good book to, to read and also because you're supporting St. John's. So thank you, John, for your generosity. Um, John uh, is a big name right now, and uh, it's just such an, a privilege to have him here. And I just want to tell you, he has recently appeared in The Atlantic and The Wall Street Journal. He's been on NPR and Science Friday. and um, and here we have him at St. John's just to ourselves. So John, thank you so oh, much. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Sari. And I'm just delighted to be here. How's that sound? Can people hear me in the back? I'm just delighted to be here. Um, Carolyn Pierce got this thing. Uh, uh, invited me, started this whole process of uh, me coming and talking about my latest book. And I'm just, a lot of you in the audience, you know who you are, have been so supportive of my writing over the years. I feel that this is my family. And uh, it really takes a village to write a book. So I'm just really grateful to, uh, to, to all of you. And I want to tell this uh, story about this book and, it's, um, and then hold a little bit of time open for questions afterwards. Um, that's the best part for me where I get to hear what you think and what, what you want to know. Uh, but this is a story of adventure, a story of courage. So I want to take you back in time. And if you can imagine for a moment that it's May 1869, just after the Civil War. You're standing in southern Wyoming territory in the no-account town of Green River, not far from the border with the Utah Territory. A naked butte overshadows a scattering of adobe buildings. The muddy Green River cuts through this dusty town. There's nothing green about it. A railroad trestle bridge crosses it. You are literally in the middle of nowhere. On a spit of sand and gravel, and next slide, thanks. Uh, on a spit of sand and gravel with a few willow trees, a mile downstream of town, if you can imagine, a large pile of supplies are piled up near four narrow rowboats. And moving around them are 10 men. Most wear their hair long and greasy. They have a don't give a damn swagger. Their eyes are bloodshot from two weeks of drinking the town's cheap local whiskey. It's known as 40 rod. I learned because it's so powerful that after drinking it, you can't walk 200 yards without falling over. <laughs> and if you listen to what the stories they told each other, they were tall tales of the West. These were met Western men. They were boastful and full of panache and lies and color. But there's a lot of truth in these stories, too. They all bear scars from Indian arrows, two close encounters with grizzly bears. They've survived starvation, falls, near drownings, and mule kicks. So what are they doing out on this crazy little spit of land with four rowboats? They're about to undergo one of the toughest expeditions in American history. 
rowing the green and Colorado River through some of the most inhospitable land in the world, including the Grand Canyon. So these men you would look at and say, what, why are they really perfect for this? They don't look perfect at all, or maybe they are. Their leader, John Wesley Powell, also at first glance does not inspire, would not inspire much confidence. He's only five, six, five feet six inches tall, and the beard often hides a grimace that seems always on his face, makes his face seem severe. It's from the near constant pain he feels in the stump of his right arm, one that he lost during the Civil War. But if you walked up to this man, you would see an extraordinary flash in his gray eyes and his left hand would grip yours with iron force, you would realize that this man is as tough as nails. He had lost that arm at the Battle of Shiloh to a Confederate mini ball at the infamous Hornet's Nest, one of the bloodiest and furious fightings of the entire war. After that terrible conflict, the nation got back to the business of business, and much of that focused on in, uh, developing the American West. All of continental America by that time had been explored, but for one notable exception. A 100 by 300 mile piece of geography that lay within the Colorado uh, Plateau. This isn't a very good drawing, but it's right in the middle here. Then the Colorado Plateau is the second highest plateau in the world, second only to one in Tibet. This is the land we now know that holds Bryce Canyon and Zion, Capitol Reef, and of course, the Grand Canyon. It's a tangled, difficult landscape, transected by deep chasms that make exploration extremely difficult. So Powell, this one-armed man, decided to finish what Lewis and Clark had started 70 years ago when they took out across the continent. What Powell did not know was staggering. They had no idea of the course of the Colorado River, did it meander all over the map, or was it peppered with huge expedition-ending falls? The latest intelligence from Native Americans in the area suggested that the river would disappear underground for miles at a time. Nobody had any doubts that there were great cataclysms of white water. Would there be places, the men asked themselves, where the sheer rock walls met the water and afforded no opportunity to pull ashore? They packed 10 months of provisions. They didn't know how long it was going to take. They included barrels of nails and some hammers to build a cabin to overwinter when they figured that the water would freeze over. Um, freezing of the water would be the last of their concerns, needless to say. And they all knew that the Green River, so they started up in Green River up here, that the Green River came down through Utah and somewhere met the Colorado River and then came down before falling off the Colorado Plateau after going through the Grand Canyon. What they did know was that they started at 6,000 feet up there and by the time they got out to the end, of course the dams weren't there then, uh, they would be at sea level. So they had to go past down 6,000 6, feet. Uh, John Wesley Powell was not your run-of-the-mill explorer or glory hound. He was a scientist, a geologist, largely self-taught. And he knew that the canyon represented one of the greatest scientific opportunities of his generation, perhaps one of the greatest in that century. Ge geologists before had largely been limited to studying stream cuts, which revealed only maybe a few hundred feet of strata. The canyons in the Colorado Plateau would provide exposed wall faces more than a wall, mile high, revealing many million years of Earth history. And this was his real motivation for his, expo his expedition, and to take scientific measurements and draw an accurate map of the Colorado's course. He would be like a kid in a candy store, but a candy store that was trying to kill him. When the eastbound Continental Railroad crossed the Green River in 1868, just at Green River City, Wyoming Territory, where we just started out, Powell saw an opportunity. With the railroad, he could bring boats of his own choosing, built in boat yards, not on the banks of the river. He picked Whitehalls, 
narrow rowboats built in, oops. Yeah, there you go. Um, no one then knew anything about running whitewater, and these boats intellectually made sense, but in practice they were disastrous. They were designed to cut through the waves of the Great Lakes and New York Harbor. The uh, New York police used them to run down fugitives, and they were used to take supplies and people to boats in the harbor. They ran fast and straight, but River Whitewater, as these men would soon learn, is a different beast altogether and requires quick negotiation, negotiating thrashing rock gardens with boats capable of quickly pivoting. And these guys, too, rode with their backs downstream. Uh, it would not occur for another generation or two that people should row facing the white water. It's funny when you kind of come across things that seem so straightforward, but that don't occur to people at the time when it's so new. But Powell was a careful, shrewd man, a planner. He had the beams of these boats reinforced. I think another, that's my, yeah. So on this one, you can see um, them in action. This is on his second trip, but in the back there is a uh, wooden chair that's bolted to the deck, and Powell would sit in it, and in the worst rapids, they would lash him to the chair so he wouldn't fall out. So you imagine that one-armed man doing that. So Powell, as I said, was a careful planner. He split, there were four boats, a scout boat, and then three freight boats, and he split the supplies evenly among the freight boats. So in case they lost one, it wouldn't be the end of the expedition. He himself, when he wasn't sitting in a chair, would wear this uh, life uh, vest, uh, which is at the Smithsonian now. Really not too much help in the water. Uh, but, uh, and of course, none of the other guys thought that that was worth wearing, uh, of course. <clears throat> Powell had planned from his time in the artillery during the Civil War a flag system in the scout boat. He'd have a flag all worked out, and he would flag uh, the ship, the boats coming after him if the rapids were too bad, and maybe they should pull over and, and walk the boats about. Um, but all of these precautions uh, would, when they were in the cannon, would amount to waving a toy gun at a gris charging grizzly bear. A mere two weeks in their trip, uh, the crew of one of the boats didn't see or ignored the frantic si signaling to pull over. Uh, the man captaining that ill-fated boat did not like taking orders from anyone, so he may just have ignored the signal. They were only just learning about the power of, of the water. By the time they realized the ferocity of rap, the rapid, they tried to get ashore, but they had water in their boat, and the pull of the current was just too strong. In moments, everything fell apart in a thunder of white water. The boat smashed into a rock and split in two. The men were thrown into the water, but they clung to one of the pieces of the boat, which in turn hit another rock and splintered. They were hurled into the water. Uh, Miraculously, the men ended up on a thin, sandy shoal. They had lost everything they owned. One man only had his bright red, long underwear bottoms, which he would later say had nearly drowned him when they fell off his waist in the water as he was kicking, uh, and they grabbed around his ankles, he almost drowned. And those two men sat on that little bank looking like they had seen a ghost, and they had. Gone was a third of their supplies, and I just had, of course, mentioned that Powell had anticipated that, though he wasn't counting on it. And, at, and although Powell had kind of worked that out, their, their safety margin had just been cut to razor thinness. One more catastrophe would doom the expedition and probably cost them their lives, and they hadn't even hit the big white water yet. In the grinding daily work of portaging and lining the boats, hard physical work that wore out backs and spirits. They were buffeted again and again by accidents. The cook tripped into the water one day and ruined their baking soda. So not a big deal, but their uh, bread was consequently unleavened. In another uh, incident, they settled at noon above a set of rapids that they wanted to scout on a thin beach nestled up against steep cliffs. The cook lit a fire to get the coffee going. 
a gust of wind picked up embers and lit an eternity's worth of dry brush and driftwood in the bushes that clung to the meager soil. It roared immediately into conflagration and caught them all flat-footed. They jumped into their boats, some with their clothes and, and beards on fire, and they tumbled backwards and forwards, spinning and shouting through that rapid. When they all somehow managed to gather uh, below the falls, one man had a hole burned in the, uh, burned in the seat of his pants. And another had his eyebrows and beard singed off. The men got to laughing, says one of the journals, for about an hour over this man's ghost-like appearance, and they couldn't stop. Kind of an indication of you know, some of who they were. The next morning, they drank their coffee out of bailing cups, because of course, they had lost all their cookware in the fire fiasco. Uh, by this point, the boats had uh, begun to leak badly requiring frequent sealing with pine tar that they scavenged. They fixed frequent holes in the hulls when they dropped their boats on a portage. Their bodies were in as bad shape as their boats. Everybody bore a list of aggravations, wrenched backs, sunburn, cuts that would not heal, twisted ankles, stomachs churned, soured, upset by too much coffee, nerves jangled. Then came the rains and their clothes rotted off their emaciated bodies. Their flour got soaked. When the sun came out again, the flour baked, then got wet again. They took to straining their flour through mosquito netting to get rid of the pernicious green mold. Every time they did that, they lost more than they saved. All new uh, stories about the Donner Party, which I'm sure you've heard about too that terrible uh, incident when a couple of uh, parties going west became snowed in on a western mountain pass and they resorted to cannibalism when their food ran out. The newspaper reports were particularly graphic. It must have crossed these men's minds as their food dwindled to half rations and then even less about who might go first and whether they could bring themselves to eat one of their mates. They were slowly starving to death and it would get worse. Tensions grew among the men, especially toward their self-contained leader, so often aloof. They did not like him ordering them around, but it was his ironclad leadership that kept them focused, kept them alive. Part of Powell's aloofness arose from his having completely different engagement with the landscape than the rest of the man, the rest of the other men. The others might marvel briefly at the bands of red, yellow, and ochre in the walls, beautiful there, that soared over their heads. But to Powell, these weren't just curiosities, but important clues to how the earth itself had formed. Each evening, despite the terrors of the day, Powell would go to do what he called geologizing, scaling the cliffs to examine the rock formations. In the 19th century, we must remember, geology was the particle physics of its day, just exploding new horizons. Many people still believed in the biblically inspired idea that the Earth was 6,000 years old. And of course, with that, as we know, came a whole host of assumptions about life and humans' place in the, on the planet. The new science of geology was revealing the idea of deep time, deep time, that Earth's history was not measured in thousands of years, but millions. It was revolutionary. It would open up room for people like Charles Darwin to imagine the theory of evolution. And it, were the, it was these kind of new discoveries that were, would usher in the modern era. In this vortex of impassive stone walls that pulled them deeper and deeper into Earth's ancient past, Powell couldn't help but viscerally feel the irresistible passage of time, not the diaphanous moments of life, love and loss, joy and pain, but the passage of eons ages, entire epochs. On one such geology, uh, <clears throat> one of his geologizing climbs, uh, he found himself stuck, one arm clinging to a rock wall, but nowhere to go, his grip slowly easing. Below him lay an 800 foot drop. His companion that day stood on a ledge above him, just out of reach. The man looked frantically for a stick or some kind of aid, but could find nothing. Then at the last minute, 
In a burst of timely inspiration, he ripped off his long underwear bottoms and dangled them over the edge. Powell fell backwards, if you can imagine, with that one arm, grabbed that underwear, which must have stretched, and swung to safety. I found it notable that uh, uh, he and the fellow Bradley, his friend, uh, made no mention at all, but just continued their climb up. And then uh, this was finally, uh, Powell was, uh, the editor was uh, of Scribner's Monthly that wanted to do a big piece on this trip that Powell had taken. He was desperate for some anecdotes, for color, anything, to get away from just the, what Powell wanted to talk about was the geology and the rocks and this and that. Finally wrung it out of him, and this became one of the most famous uh, pieces uh, in that time, time of dime novels of this really great. And, but you'll notice, too, that in uh, kind of a nod to Victorian propriety, uh, his friend up there, Bradley, is still wearing his pants that he's throwing. <laughs> like few others before him, Powell came to understand how much the Earth has changed. Its surface morphed, upheaved, buckled, weathered, and inundated by seas, eroded by rain. In our lives, the landscape around us remains static, seemingly imperturbable. But Powell could see that the, con that the Earth was in constant change, although certainly, of course, not on the timeline of human life. He read in the rock layers evidence of cataclysmic changes caused by volcanic events, by inland seas washing in and out, by massive deep earth forces that literally bent rock. The new, this new view of the earth, its deep time, caused an epiphany of sorts for Powell, one that would catalyze a career as one of the, he would go on to become one of the most, America's most influential scientists. And that fraught trip would send him on a different kind of journey toward becoming one of America's most practical and significant visionaries. But he had to get home first. After two and a half months, they finally entered the Grand Canyon uh, itself. And they start as one does today, and a few of you have been on that trip at Lee's Ferry. Uh, you start at your elbow with this really lovely soapy rock. It's called Kaibab limestone. It's 250 million years old. Uh, around the time when T-Rexes were running around. In the course of a little over 200 miles, they would descend through 19 different rock layers. Towards the end, if you squint it up, you could see the Kaibab 6,000 feet above their heads. So you really have this sense of, and you, in essence, were going back in time when you looked at those walls. At the bottom, they would hit basement rock, some of the oldest rock exposed found on the Earth, Earth surface. Here is Precambrian pre Vishnu Schist, great name, Vishnu Schist, so dark black that it sucks a hole in the sunshine, dark, dreamless, once laid down by sediments, then hardened by immense heat and pressure created almost two billion years ago, at a time before oxygen-breathing organisms developed on Earth. Cut uh, through, uh, you can't really see it here too, too well, but the Vishnu Schist are these veins of Zoroaster granite, that's raspberry sherbet-like rocks. I just love the color. I stuck a little piece in my pocket, and I came back and uh, I went to Strohsneider's, and I had them match the paint, and I painted my, uh, my study, my writing study, with that paint. And so uh, I was just so impressed with it. Um, so um, that hard rock, the Vishnu Schist, uh, also created murderous white water. They carried their boat around some of it, they lowered with lines on other difficult sections, but a lot, a lot of times they had no uh, option just to barrel through. Any pretense that this was a scientific expedition was now forgotten. All of their barometers were broken or lost. The maps they had drawn and the data they had captured were lost in capsizes, blotted out by the rain or by the waves. They were now, Powell would note rather laconically, but in deadly earnest, in a race for dinner. 
Now each roaring rapid presented an agonizing choice. Run it and get through quickly, but risk a catastrophic accident in the waves. Or reduce that possibility by portaging around or lining their boats. But portaging and lining tax their bodies and their dwindling food supplies even more. So they were caught in a vise. They saw water that few people had ever seen, if any, had seen before. They encountered whirlpools so strong that they captured the boats and sent them spinning like carnival rides. They came up against 15-foot standing waves, skirted and sometimes fell into large, gaping holes in the river's surface. They were buffeted by violent upwelling boils in the water. Later boatmen, of course, would give names to some of these odd features, haystacks, pillows, and rooster tails. But for these men, it was all new. In the inner canyon of the Grand, <clears throat> these battered, weary men came to one set of rapids that simply defied comprehension. They shouted to be heard among them, the roar of the, rap, rap, roar of the water, which seemed to be all foam, spit, and fury. There was no way around it. A portage would involve lifting their boats 800 feet uh, high up these vertical cliffs and then lowering them down again. They didn't have time for that. Their food would run out in the days that that would take to do that. They had to run it no matter what. Three of the men on the trip just shook their heads and said no more. They were not cowards, though they've sometimes been portrayed as that. But they looked at that water and they felt what they had gone through before, and they said this was too much. They liked their chances better to climb those cliffs and strike out across the desert for 75 miles to where they thought a Mormon settlement would be. With the barometers lost or broken, you know, barometers can be gauge the altitude that they had gone down. Remember that 6,000 miles they were needing to do. The barometer's broken, they really didn't know how much was left. In some cases, the river, in one day, they would go nine or 10 miles, and the river would come right back to where they had started, within a couple hundred yards of where they had started. It's a great meandering circle. So they just didn't know where they were, how long they would be in this canyon. Powell figured they had to be close, but such musings did not convince the three men. On the walk out, they would have limited food, of course, no containers to carry water. They would have their rifles, so they might find some game. But the expedition, um, <clears throat> but it was still going to be, it was a tough gamble. Some expedition members later would claim that the tensions between Powell and these three men had grown intolerable. But they, from all accounts of the journal, split up the remaining food equitably, solemnly shook hands, some even shed tears. The rest of the, of the group jumped into their boats for the ride of their lives. And for the details of that, you'll have to read my book. <laughs> but all I can tell you is when the river, that the river spit out the remaining starving men just 20, a little over 24 hours later, the cliff walls receding, the waters turning languid, they were at sea level now and out of harm's way. Powell reached for an analogy to describe his feelings of relief, and the only one he could find was going back to the Civil War when he was in that tent. Uh, and he was suffering with that terrible injury that eventually would claim his arm. He wrote, quote, when he who's been chained by wounds to a hospital cot until his canvas tent seems like a dungeon cell, until the groans of those who lie about tortured with probe and knife are piled up, a weight of horror on his ears that he cannot throw off, cannot forget, until the stench of festering wounds and anesthetic drugs has filled the air with its loathsome burden. When at last he goes out into the open field, what a world he sees, how beautiful the sky, how bright the sunshine. These men had traveled some 1,000 miles in three months, not even close to the 10 months uh, they had anticipated. Uh, they came out with just a few handfuls of flour left. I mean, it was right down to the bare bones. They still had plenty of coffee, but that, I'm not sure that helped much. And as for those three men that walked out, they vanished without a trace. To this day, it remains one of the biggest mysteries uh, in the American West. The leading theory is that they had a violent encounter with Indians in the desert, probably confused about where these men came from, 
how they were surviving out in that terrible uh, desert uh, without any support. But there are also theories that perhaps the Mormons were involved, mistaking them for federal marshals attempting to arrest some Mormon fugitives. A Paiute chief would later tell uh, Powell that and, and, and admit to the murders. But still, there remains to this day no conclusive evidence about what happened, certainly nothing that I could find. And of course, the great irony of it all was that had those three men just stayed on the river for just a few more hours, they would have made it out alive. And it tormented the others for the rest of their lives. Afterwards, Powell became an instant hero. But I really uh, believe that um, he really felt like a failure ultimately. Certainly, he had, they had come out uh, with their lives, but everything else had been lost. It, be, it had become just a, uh, a crazy adventure. So he set back out on the river to do it again in 1871 and 1872. This journey is much less exciting, though there were certainly a lot of close calls. Uh, and they had to end it a little early because the water started rising. But they finished up the valuable surveying work so they could make a map. And from this map, he would be, survey the Colorado Plateau and become the, eventually the leading force behind the establishment of the US Geological Survey and helped to make federal science a permanent part of the Washington landscape. He would uh, devise the discipline of geomorphology, the study of the formation of the Earth's surface. He would institute the first massive federal science project, the mapping of the entire United States. Very ambitious uh, project that wouldn't be fill, uh, finished until the end of last century. He would put together the first large-scale systematic study of native peoples ever done and go on to found the Bureau of Eth Ethnology at the Smithsonian, learn to speak Ute, and he had a very empathetic understanding of American Indians, was in a lot, involved in a lot of treaties and a lot of, uh, it, it just, a, just a fascinating kind of aspect to him. His tireless work in introducing America to the Grand Canyon would change perceptions about this remote, difficult feature from an awful place to be avoided into one of America's most iconic natural fe features and a symbol of nation's exceptional nature. But, but perhaps most importantly, and why I give you all the details of that terrible trip in 1869, the, the experience for Powell deep within the earth to reveal and see what the earth was all about, the change it was, and to understand how fleeting a uh, human being's presence was in that big picture. Um, as America would look towards exploiting the West resources, Powell became a forceful voice advocating careful, sustainable development of the land and water. Americans, he argued, needed to listen not just to their, to their ideals and ambitions, but to what the land told them, what was sustainable in the long term. Otherwise, the future would consist of shortages, endless litigation, feuds over infrastructures and water each one a threat to a democratic society. And these are the things we're seeing today. Few listens to his warnings then, to Western senators, railroad barons, and millions of immigrants looking for a better life. The arid West beckoned like an Eden. And you can't blame them. Few could escape the pull of manifest destiny, the idea that America's future lay in the divinely conferred right of Americans to push across the country and take what it wanted. <laughs> But environmental catastrophe lay ahead in the wake of, of this headlong and heedless development. By the 1930s, Powell had been long dead by that point, the Dust Bowl saw much of the West's topsoil blow away. A great 10,000-foot cloud came to Washington, D.C., 1,000 miles from the West, begrimed federal office buildings in the spring of 1934 and 1935. Powell had been right. As we consider today the ravages of global warming, I just want to end with Powell's admonitions to become ecological stewards make urgent sense. Even more than he anticipated, even more than he anticipated is on the line now, not just our democracy, but life on Earth. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one more slide, I think, yeah. 
And I would love to uh, have questions uh, or talk about anything that seems interesting to folks. I have two questions. One is very short. Did they drink that muddy river water? Yeah, they did. And it got so muddy that it started doing bad things to their insides. So they had to be very careful with that. So they were looking a lot for the rain in pockets on the rock next door because it got so unpalatable that it was rough. And my second question is, um, some years ago I read a book called Cadillac Desert. And I think that Powell suggested that um, instead of doing that grid, that they should have a state that was the watershed. Yes. Um, it yeah. was a very interesting idea. I was very struck by it at the time. Was that who yeah. said that? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because uh, uh, Powell uh, came in front of the National Academy of Sciences, a bunch of gray beards, uh, the biggest, uh, most influential scientists of his day, and he unrolled a map of the United States and it's a very simple map, of, and there was a line down the 100th meridian, generally, and that's a line that goes uh, from uh, Mexico up through Texas and wends its way right up all the way through the Dakotas to California. And he said, look at this line, because this is what America is all about. It was an isohydrate, which is a rain line. And very simply, what he was doing was calling to the attention that everything to the east of that line right, going back, gets 20 inches or more of rain. And everything to the west of that line, generally, gets 20 inches or less. Why is that important, he said? Well, conventional agriculture needs 20 inches of rain, at least, unless it's supported, right? So he was saying that to develop the country, to develop the west, we had to look at the west in a very different way, right? So he was very much loved these maps and all like that, became the US head of the US Geological Survey. A few years later, he brought out another map. He wasn't just saying that the West was arid. He drew out another map, and it's like um, in front of the Senate, and it looks like somebody took a paintball, and I wish I had a picture here. It's very colorful, and dotted a picture of the West, just shot at this, you know, just all these different colors. And these were watersheds, the areas where, the wa where water is contained. And he started talking about how we should think about watershed commonwealths. He had some very innovative ideas about tying ownership of the water to the land. He had studied Mormon use of the water. He had studied Spanish use of water and uh, Indian use of water. Uh, he was thinking in ways that uh, really were foreshadowing the tragedy of the commons, which is what happens when a, when a lot of multiple interests are interested in a resource that is common to all, and terrible things, as we know, can happen. Fishing, you know, fish can get just uh, decimated in the ocean, uh, um, and this, he believed, might be true with water as well. So he started talking about issues, about how to keep water issues local. He wasn't averse to dams, but I think he would have been horrified to think about the dams that we have today, 800 feet tall and changing things. The Colorado River today um, sits between two dams and is really a canal with controlled water. The warm, muddy water that he ran down now is cold because it's let through the, at, uh, the lake, uh, the, the lower parts of the lake, so the water is cold. Colorado now is one of the most, con is the most contested river in the world. Uh, every drop of it is claimed by one uh, group or another. By the time it gets to Mexico, it crosses, the, whenever it crosses the border where it used to flow into Mexico and off to the ocean, dries up. It's just desert. And uh, so what Powell was really talking about was really thinking about okay, it's not just that it's dry, but how can we limit water monopolies? The whole idea of us today sending water three or 400 miles over mountains through canals to get to other places would not, uh, would have just have horrified him. He also understood that the aquifers underneath, the great fossil water uh, bodies underneath, uh, like the Ogala um, aquifer, were built up over millions and millions of years. And now we get deep, deep drilling, and it's going down and down and down and down and down. Um, and very, very 
uh, limited replenishment of that. I mean, some, with, uh, but not certainly enough to replace that. So he would have looked at some of the rapid in urban development of the West today, where a lot of urban development is, is going on, um, and say, well, are you thinking about your water, where you're going to get it? And a lot of these questions are still not being asked. So really, he was not what would one call an environmentalist in terms of, you know, like John Muir, or the way we understand an environmentalist today. He was a man of his time. He believed that the resources of the earth were there for Americans to realize their great glory. So he believed in that. But he did also realize, fundamentally, that changing, that, that pushing too hard on the earth, expecting what it can't deliver, this is a kind of a critical and revolutionary understanding of sustainability. He was really one of the first to get out and really talk about. And it was, he would get shot down terribly. The, uh, his, uh, his, he would be impugned, and uh, newspapers would uh, write scathing things about him. Senators were uh, putting up rumors of his uh, sexual peccadilloes, which, from what I could find, were non-existent. And uh, it was a really, a, he had, there was quite a really rabid response. People felt he was standing in the way of American progress. And Powell was there, the strident voice. Um, this is the second part of his courage, you know, um, saying, no, I'm not in the way of progress. The way toward progress, the way toward progress is to talk about these issues and to think about it and to work it out, not just go heedlessly on, not just to have this kind of incredible optimism that everything is going to work out, that technology is going to fix everything. Um, but to say, no, let's think about this. And he got steamrolled, as many visionaries do. It seems that they're, you know, they come out swimming up against the, the uh, current and they get bowled over. But their words and their concepts live. And, uh, and in, certainly in Powell's case, so many of them came, came true. Long answer to a short fancy. All right, the question was, why did I uh, pick Powell? Why was I attracted to him? Well, you know, as a, it, it's so interesting. As a kid, I was really drawn to his journals and his story of going through the river. It was very exciting, and I just loved that. And then, uh, as I worked as an editor at Smithsonian uh, Magazine, I came across his studies of American Indians. And then I went down a river in Canada. It was a, a first run. You know, nobody had done it before. And so I kind of, he was my patron saint. I kind of felt he was on my shoulder. And as I got to thinking about this guy, I couldn't um, really uh, put together this kind of grizzled explorer with this visionary. And I wanted to kind of see, and it really became a puzzle. So I wanted to push beyond the waves and the starvation. It's an incredible story. It's, it's one of, it's Homeric. But it often gets in the way of really looking at this man and really what, this, what, what he was all about. And so I saw this incredible exam, you know, example of courage in very different manifestations. And so I, tr I really felt impelled to try to integrate all of that. And then, of course, it just led me to really think a lot about and to write uh, about recently, you know, about that the climate changes, the discussion of cl the climate wars we're going through right now, they've been going on for a while, right? They weren't talking about global, global climate change then. They didn't know that, but they were, Powell was beginning to talk about Let's look at the, the land in terms of climate, and let's, let's act accordingly. And got shot down pretty badly for that, but he had raised the idea of that. And I think it's a really, really uh, important, um, you know, to understand our American history in the, con you know, going, uh, of the global climate change discussions now. Why are people so vehemently against stuff when there is so much strong scientific evidence? Um, and uh, I could say that the same things about American identity and progress are also, are also a play today as they were back then. And this idea of people getting in the way, and it, and it tags into a very long conversation about American sense of optimism, of destiny, that manifest destiny. That's all still here today. 
And unfortunately, it wasn't until the Dust Bowl came and pretty much slapped everybody across the face with the rampant uh, plowing and, and such things that disrupted the topsoil so badly and led to the ruin of so many lives uh, that people really woke up to the fact of this. And then Powell really seemed then as very prescient. So my only concern today is that we don't have to repeat that and have to wait until something really awful happens. Because in the case of global climate change, we're walking very close to the edge and we might not be able to come back from it. Dan. Um, thanks, John. Great talk. Um, I'm wondering, did you find it, is that working? <laughs> did you find any, um, is there an academic connection or a social connection between Powell and Frederick Jackson Turner at all? I'm curious if they ever crossed paths, if, if there was a relationship between yeah. what Powell found and, Tur and Turner's thesis, which I'm guessing is maybe 15 years or so later, or 20 years after the expedition. Is there any connection you know of? That's a good question, Dan. You know, that's a, uh, I don't think that they overlapped. I think he certainly knew about it, because as everybody did. Um, so much of what uh, that's all about has to do with an understand. And Turner, as you guys may or may not know, call, you know, said that the end of the frontier was over. That there in a, around 1890, that there was no more kind of movement. That everything it's you know was done, and that developed kind of ideas about what America was about as a result of the fact that everything kind of had ended from a frontier basis. There are large holes in that theory. It's too complicated to get into right now. But this all has to do with wrestling, and Powell was a big part of this, with how we understand the American West. Because they're, they're almost like we have two con different countries. You know, um, The American West is so different climatologically, everything, geologic, geologically, geographically, from the East. And the early, early days, um, for the most part of our, uh, before the Civil War, uh, people considered the American West the great American desert. They really felt, and there was a thing, and this really shaped how we thought about who we were as Americans, that basically that, the, um, that it was just this fraught desert, terrible Sahara-like desert, and that the America ended at the Rocky Mountains. And you have to remember then, too, that the British and the Russians and, uh, and the Spanish were uh, on the coast. And we had some, pre you know, Americans had some presence there. But generally, that America kind of ended there, right? And that the mountains were this great barrier. And it wasn't until the Civil War came around right after it that this got, the, the idea of the great American desert got flipped on its head. And suddenly people um, were talking about how this was a great Eden. It was this incredible change. That there was, and this was pushed by the boosters of the railroads. They came up with these ideas about how it was the Italy of America, the Switzerland of America out there, and all you had to do was go out there. You know, it wasn't like that at all. It was this incredible shift. And what Powell was saying was saying, well, no, it's not, um, it's not an Eden out there. It's not unproductive, but the quarter section, the way we had developed the country before was, in the, in the Midwest, if you were a pioneer, you got 160 acres, a quarter section, they called it. And if you lived on it for five years, you could make it productive, then it was yours. This was great American dream kind of stuff. When we went out to the West, Powell said, that's not gonna work. So what, and then, and what Turner would get into later, which would take the conversation into different places, was really what is the role of the frontier in our lives how does it shape our character of our country? But it is all about how we integrate the West into an understanding. When Powell was out there, you have to understand, of course, there were no novels about the American West. There were no photographs, right? There was no artwork. There was no conceptualization, right? When he drew that map of the 100th meridian on, you can see that from space now, right? Um, you can see it clearly delineated where the dryness really begins. You know, of course, he didn't have that opportunity to be in space or in an airplane or anything like that. He visualized that. So these things really, really root and resonate in our understanding of who we are as a continent, as a continental, our continental self, 
uh, I found a lot of these discussions. This is a long conversation. I'm sorry I'm going on too long, but yeah. Earl. Um, <clears throat> you've talked uh, about Powell as a, a scholar, an explorer, a visionary, but not so much about him as a person. And uh, kind of the precipitated, I've read the book, and it's a great book. Um, the story of those the seven people who finished the trip, frequently that sort of thing bonds people together. They survived. But I think you had contact with only one thereafter, and that one didn't seem that anxious to be with him. What does that say about Powell as a man, as a person? Very good question, Earl. And there's a lot of controversy. And you go down the river, you talk to the guides, and they're full of all kinds of ideas about, you know, Powell, was he an autocrat, or was he just doing his job, or what? And, and that's another very interesting conversation. He was a uh, used to military discipline, so he was a he was a tough he was a tough guy. Um, at times, not empathetic, but he always kept his eye on the prize, which was getting through. And I came out after looking at him as a real. Uh, uh, I've been on. I've been on, I think we tend to forget sometimes, I've been on rivers, and this was in a day of satellites and stuff, so if we were in trouble up in the Arctic, maybe we'd get rescued in two weeks or three weeks or something, you know, by the time it all worked out. These guys had no hope of really being rescued in any time. I think we forget how uncertainty just can really, really poke holes in a group of men, and I think a lot of that happened, and they got beaten up pretty badly. Um, there wasn't really much room in that for nice guy sensibility. It's a whole different dynamic. Um, even to the second river when things happened. The second time around, he picked people he knew better, uh, picked some scientists and all like this. I thought his decision was really easy to pick a, bunch, a real motley crew of difficult, difficult people, you know, real independent Westerners. And I think that, that the flip side of that, the fact was that got them through it because they had that ability to laugh when in the face of you know, terrible privation. But it also opened up possibilities for you know, you know, hostile interactions, as, as some of them did, and, and, and all that. I w did want to break out, uh, personally, you know, one thing I was so interested in is, in is um, uh, Powell as a young man, he had this formative experience. I still can't get it out of my mind. His father was a Methodist preacher, um, and he and his wife had come over uh, from England. And they started up in New York in the burned over district where so many amazing things were going on uh, with new religions being founded. He, but he, he set out too many preachers up here. He moved south to Ohio, right near the border with the Ohio River and Kentucky, which as we know right then was the bright line. You know, the, Kentucky was a slave state and Ohio was a free state. And they moved to this little town of Jackson. And uh, I uncovered that there was a very large African that nobody had ever figured out before because it doesn't exist anymore. But I found it that there was a large African American population right there, and it was the center for the Underground Railroad in the 1830s, which was just beginning to get going. At this time, uh, Powell's father became an abolitionist, and those were back then that was a bad word. People. Um, uh, Emerson called them a bunch of kind of lunatics, crazy, dangerous lunatics, uh, because what they were talking about was not just ab abolishing slavery, but they were talking about this very worrisome thing to many white people about the equality of men, uh, of blacks and whites, the fact that maybe a black man could marry a white woman. This was very threatening. So Powell, as a 10-year-old boy, was in school, and one day in after school, and he got stoned by his contemporaries over his father's open abolitionism. And it bruised him, uh, you know, I think more you know, spiritually and mentally than uh, you know, though I think he was hit. Um, so he moved away. He was pulled out of school, of course, and uh, sat under the tutelage of a very interesting character in the book, 400 pound man, kind of known as the Samuel Johnson of the backwoods, this great geologist and really interesting guy who totally got John Wesley Powell interested in, um, 
in natural history and all like that. But this opened this, this incredible thing and with his father watching some of the abolitionists of the day come through, seeing um, uh, uh, African American folks on the Underground Railroad get killed. Um, he saw their bodies, I believe, um, for, for being in the trade of getting uh, escaped slaves out of there. Really, really put him into a, uh, put him as an outsider so he could look in, but it also seemed to kind of give him a certain empathy for the way people other than him worked. So when he was start working with Indians, and Indians then, for people out west, they were dangerous, they were dirty, they were different. And the whole idea of a better dead, better dead than alive Indian was very much what all the men on his trip believed. But not for Powell, you really wanted to learn from them. He, he really spent some time with the Mormons, and the Mormons, of course, were greatly reviled. Um, not understood, they had these crazy polygamous theories and you know, all this stuff, but Powell was in there talking to Brigham Young and all this and learning from them. Uh, during the Civil War, he, he was a colonel in a, uh, in a colored regiment. And, uh, and I think a lot of that ability to stand apart and to look would, that would later lead to some of his visionary stuff, you know, came from those seminal relationships in, uh, in Ohio. The family finally had to leave because a mob came up to their house and uh, threw paint on their house and cut the tail off their horse and violence was moving closer and closer and closer. So his father picked up his young family and went out of town and Powell never looked back and never made mention of it again, but I think it was deeply, deeply um, John, anyway. thank you. Um, we have 15 minutes before the 11:15 service. John's going to sign some books. Sure. Is that right? Sure. Um, Teresa, our accounting manager. If you haven't met her, this is this is her. She'll be over here selling the books. John will be signing them. And uh, let's just thank John for his gift tonight. <laughs>